Hello everyone and welcome to Pencil vs. Pixel. My name is Caesar, and I am your host. And I have the pleasure of being joined today by Mr. Dan Mall of Super Friendly. Hey Dan. Hey Caesar. how's it going? Going great, thank you for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me, I appreciate it. Dan's the founder of the award-winning design agency Super Friendly. And he's done exceptional work for companies like TechCrunch, Entertainment Weekly, and many more. He's also co-host of the Businessology Show with a previous Pencil vs. Pixel guest, Jason Blummer. So, Dan, before we continue, I'm going to ask you, Pencil or Pixel? Uh, I have to say Pixel. Um, most of my time is spent at a computer, and uh, I think the only exception is actually in the shower. I have, uh, I have these things called Aqua Notes. Um, and that's basically the only time I use a pencil is just to scribble ideas when I'm in the shower. So Dan, let's get to know you and what you do a little bit better. What's your, what's your story? Um, oh boy. Well, I'm a designer. Uh, I'm the founder of, like you said, a, a, an agency called Super Friendly. And um, we like working on things that are fun and brave and, and uh, interesting to us. Um, I don't know. What else can I tell you about it? How deep do you want me to go? <laughs> yeah, so what kind of stuff do you guys do? I mean... Um, so I think an easy way to describe it or the way that I describe it to people that don't exactly uh, know that like the way I would describe it to it, my dentist or something is that anything for a screen is is stuff that we feel comfortable making. So it could be a website, it could be an app, it could be a touch screen, it could be any sort of interface. Um, if it's if it deals with pixels, we feel pretty good making that. Um, and then a lot of the other work that we do, you know, aside from that is we do a lot of consulting and we do a lot of strategy work with with clients. Um, some of our clients are just people that, know that they need to make something and it has to exist in a digital space, but they're not exactly sure what that is or even how to think about it. Um, so a lot of our work is just sort of coming in and, and workshopping with them and helping them to, to think through it and, and helping them to articulate it and then just sort of writing up some thoughts for them and saying like, you know, here's a, here's a way that you guys can think about your identity or about your product in a way that you may not have been able to before. For the folks out there that don't know your, your full back story, um, why don't you give us a little overview of what you've uh, how you got into becoming a designer and uh, and and then running your own design agency super friendly okay cool um, so when I, I when I was growing up I, I loved to draw a lot and I used to read comic books and watch cartoons just all the time um, and so I really wanted to be an artist or an animator when I grew up and and uh, um, I went to school for animation initially and uh, I realized when I got to animation school that I wasn't really cut out for it because everybody else was way better than I was and I was just really slow and, and poor. Um, but but I was lucky because the program that I was in, I, was, I went to Drexel University in Philadelphia and uh, I majored in digital media and I got lucky because that program was, was split between animation and, and like web and interactive. So the stuff, when I discovered that I wasn't really good at the animation side, I actually discovered that I really liked the web and the interactive side. Um, and, uh, and as I was looking for more classes like that to take, um, I sort of stumbled across graphic design you know, in the course catalog. And, and I didn't even know what graphic design was you know, by the time I went to college. And I realized that when I, when I started reading about things like typography classes or visual communication classes, that those were actually the things that I was interested in. So I sort of did, a, I, I did an independent study in graphic design as well as majoring in digital media. And so the, the sort of combination of the two kind of led me to where I am today, you know, just being really interested in design and what it looks like on, screen, uh, on screens and, and in pixels as opposed to like on paper, on billboards and magazines and stuff. So you know, I have a, an appreciation for, for graphic design and uh, certainly how it translates to digital. Um, and that's kind of what got me interested in, in the web. So, you know, when I was in school, I, I had a bunch of internships and, and I worked at like smaller agencies around, around the Philly area. Um, and uh, eventually um, started, I, helped, I was one of the founding members of, of Happy Cog Philadelphia um, when that started in Philly. Um, and I was the interactive director there for a while. And then uh, around um, the time that my, my wife and I got married, we decided that we would just move somewhere else that we've never been to before, um, and that we, sorry, that we've never lived in before. Uh, and so we decided to move to New York because we both sort of grew up around Philly. So we decided, you know, let's go move to Brooklyn and see if we can, if we can hang for a while. Uh, and so I, um, I worked at a place called Big Spaceship and I was a design director there for a few years. And then when we decided to have kids, we, we moved back to Philly to be closer to our family because both of our families are around here. Um, and then we figured it was a good time for, for us to start uh, a new thing, start, you know, start my own thing, um, which is called Super Friendly. 
Where did the, where did the name Super Friendly come from? <laughs> well, I had a I had a name already picked out, and um, I don't know that I'll I'll say what it is because it's it's not as good. But um, I did you know I did all of the branding and I did a website for it. And I had all the the art direction set out, and my wife just never really loved it. She was always like, "Nah, it's all right." Um, and I liked it. And I guess I was like I was pretty sold on it. Um, and she was like, "I don't know. You just gotta pick something that's super friendly." <laughs> and I was like. <laughs> Oh, and uh, and she was like, "Yeah, that's yeah, that's it." So all good things come from my wife. I'm learning this more and more. Um, but super friendly basically came from from her in, in conversation. Nice. So how many people are in the uh, in, in the company right now? How many uh, total as far as designers uh, and whatnot? It, it's a tricky question. Um, technically, I am the only employee of Super Friendly. There are no other employees. Um, I have a producer that I work with regularly. Um, his name is Matt Cook and he, he lives in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, and we work on every project that comes in the door. Um, so since, since we opened, I think he signed on on like day eight of us opening. Um, and he, is, he works on every project that I work on. And then we use what's, what we call the super friend model on all of our projects, which is that for every project we build a custom team for it. So some projects will need like a PHP developer or some projects we need a particular type of illustrator or an information architect with a particular background or some junior designers or you know whatever it might be and we'll sort of build a team around that project and then after the project everybody goes their separate ways. So we've worked on projects that are as small as just the two of us um, and we've worked on other projects that were as large as uh, I think 18 people was our largest project. Um, I would say our sweet spot's probably in the like five to six person team range. I mean that feels really good and that's like most of the projects that we do. Um, so, so team, team is always a tricky question because nobody else is employed, but you know, I do end up working with a lot of people, which I really enjoy. So the, uh, for the majority of the people that you work with, are, are they freelancers or, uh, do they have, do they work at agencies or a little bit of both? Um, it's, yeah, it's sort of a mix of, of stuff. I mean, there's some people that, that I work with that just sort of moonlight, you know, they can give me their nights and weekends and that's cool if they're the right, if they're the right skill set. Um, some other people are, you know, they are independent consultants, you know, either they own their own small agencies or, or they're freelancing, you know, and that works out really well too. I mean, really the people that I try to work with most are the people that are the right fit for the project. You know, I think that's the most important. And if we find the right fit, you know, we're happy to work around people's schedules and, and make sure that it, it works with um, the constraints of the project. But um, I think if we work with the right people, then work is easy. You know, if you work with the wrong people, work sucks. Definitely. All right. Are you planning on keeping super friendly small? Yes. Um, I have zero plans to hire any employees or anything like that. The idea of paying salaries just scares me to death. I, you know, um, big props to people who own companies and have employees. I just don't know how you guys sleep at night. Uh, it's, um, I sleep fine now, and I would like to keep it that way. Uh, so I, I have I have zero plans to turn super friendly into like a big mega like huge corporation. Um, it, it's it's not at all what I want. I've got plans for what it's going to be, you know, sometime in the future. Uh, but I think whatever it, it turns into, it's going to be pretty small. Um, just because you know I, I never set out for it to be a, an agency, and really the way I think about it is it is it's a, it's more of a, a collaborative, you know. Um, and I think. I really like that model, and it provides me some independence. It provides independence to the people that I work with, that they enjoy, that they value. Um, and so I really like keeping that, and I'll, I'm going to try to keep it that way as, as long as I can, as long as the IRS doesn't force me to do anything different. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Dan, you wrote an article. Um, it wasn't too long ago, but you wrote an article, article titled How to Get the Work You Want. Mm. Uh, resonates a ton i mean it resonates so much and it actually reminds me of a lot of guests that 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 uh that i had on on the show which have said you know they've been working on personal projects and because of those personal projects a lot of really big opportunities showed up mm -hmm. um it also reminds me of uh what seth Godin refers to as uh, uh picking yourself yeah um, so you, you you've you've named off two tips on on your uh on that article and I'm just going to go ahead and, and, and say them right now. Uh, you, say, you say make your own work and contribute to conversations that you want to be a part of. Um, yep. Can you talk to us more about you know, what you mean by picking or uh, you know, choose, choosing your own work? And um, if you could also give some more insight sure. about that. Yeah, happy to. Um, you know, I think one of the things that 
uh, I guess that when I wrote the article, it, it was targeted at a bunch of different people in, in different places in their careers. Um, one of the things that I do sort of, I don't know if it's part of super friendly work or, or kind of the side of it, but I consult a lot and I coach a lot with um, freelancers and small agencies and uh, and I end up having the same conversations over and over again, right? So one of the reasons that I love having a blog is sometimes when I have conversations a lot, I'll just document those conversations and post them so that if I ever have to refer to them again, I could, it's just sort of a reminder to me, but also I could just send links to, to clients and just say like, hey, check this out. You know, I've, I've had these conversations before. I've been thinking about this for a long time. You know, check this out and let's talk about it. Um, so I think that the, both of the, those tips are targeted at two different types of people. The make your own work is usually conversations that I have with students or people that are just starting out where they're, you know, the dilemma is, well, like Nike's not going to hire me or, or, you know, my dream client's not going to hire me because I don't have a portfolio of work. Um, and I think a lot of people are under the illusion that you have to only show work in your portfolio that people hire you or pay you to do. And I don't think that's true at all. I think portfolios are a, refle are a reflection of who you are and what you like to do. You know, that has nothing to do with what people pay you for. So I think um, a lot of people are just sort of overlooking the opportunity to make things that they like. And, and kind of what you just said, uh, you, you know, when you asked the question, a lot of people like surprisingly get opportunities from their side projects. But when you think about it, it's not so surprising. When people see that you're passionate about a thing, you naturally do that thing really well if you're passionate about it. And so people want you to do that for them. You know, so that's why I think side projects have a lot of traction is because people are passionate about them. They're so passionate that even though they have a full-time job, they're like, I'm going to stay up late and spend my nights and my weekends and, and make another thing. You know, and I think that passion sort of comes through in that work. So you know, whenever I talk to students or whenever I talk to people that are like, you know, how do I fill my portfolio if nobody will hire me? I'm like, who cares if nobody will hire you? you know, just make the work that you want. Invent stuff. You know? And uh, I think I said in the article, if you're having trouble coming up with stuff, Send me an email and I'll write you a brief for what you should make. And I've probably written like maybe like 200 briefs for people, you know, from that. Um, maybe I'll post that somewhere too. But, um, you know, I have fun doing that. I have fun saying, okay, what are you into? And let me come up with a project for you. And, uh, and everybody's been pretty positive. You know, when I send them ideas, they go like, cool, like that's a great idea. I never would have thought about it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it and I'll keep you updated. And so, you know, I'm certainly eager to see, to see what people come back with. Um, on, on the second question, which is more, um, is more a bit targeted towards, like, I think, more experienced people, which is, um, like, okay, now that we're experienced, now that we're, even if we're a small agency, like, how do we actually get the work that we want to get? And I think um, it, it's weird. There, there's this weird, like, false sense of security in, in our industry because a lot, of, a lot of us don't have to do a lot of, like, outbound marketing. You know, a lot of us just sort of take the work that comes in, and that's great. Like, there's a ton of work out there. And so many people that I know run their businesses just on inquiries. Like they don't do any marketing. They don't do any sort of like proactive searching for leads. Um, and that's great. You know, that means like there's a big demand for the stuff that we do. But a lot of people mistake that into saying like, well, this is the only stuff that I can do. You know, and, and they get used to that idea that like, well, it's just incoming. And if nothing's coming in, then that means the industry is shot. Well, it, it might mean that you you know, you need to do a little bit of digging for it. So I think um, one of the things about doing the work that you want is it it is risky and it's hard, you know, and it takes effort. Um, and it takes more effort than just like sitting and waiting for emails. But I think it's it's important to do that. If if you want a particular type of work that you're not getting, go out and get it. You know, like I've gotten like a ton of projects just by emailing agencies and people that I admire saying, Hey, I'd love to work with you on something. Can we work on something? And sometimes they say, "Oh, yes, I have something right, you know, right away that I, I would love to try you out on." And sometimes it takes two years for that person to email me back and say, "Hey, remember we talked two years ago? We, I have a project for you." You know, so I, so I think um, I don't know if I wrote this in the article, but that's a, that's a long game. You know, it's not like a. I don't think anybody should expect to, um, you know, to do that and then immediately get inquiries from it. I think it's important that like you know you you see it as an investment, um, but I think those investments really pay off. Very cool, man. Yeah, it's two years sometimes? Uh, sometimes more than that. I mean, I've had, like, there have been people that I've worked with in my first job as, like, an intern that are now just saying, like, hey, I just saw you on LinkedIn and saw that you did this thing. Like, can we do a project together? I'm like, yeah, like, I barely remember you because I worked, you know, I, I rounded the corners on your business cards. You know, that's all I did for them, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, you know, and, and then five years later or whatever, ten years later, then, um, you know, it turns into a project. So I think it's definitely a long game and it's an investment. Um, and a lot of people are looking for shortcuts. And it's not a, it's not a shortcut, you know. Doing the work that you want and, and being at the place that you want takes hard work and it takes investment. Um, but, but I think it pays off. 
What do you recommend for a person that, uh, let's say, uh, a designer has been working at an agency or or at a company, and uh, wants to wants to go off on their own and become a freelancer or or form their own agency or their own company? What would your mm-hmm. um, what's what's your advice to 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 that type of or that kind of designer before sure, um, before they make that jump? Yeah, I mean, it's a tough question. Yeah, it's it's something that a lot of people struggle with. I struggled with it, you know, for a long time. Um, I'm I'm writing a book on about it this year because I just want to get my thoughts out about it. Um, I think it's important to prototype. You know, I think we like designers and developers are used to doing that in our work, but we don't really think about our lives or our businesses that way. Um, and I wish more people did. Um, one of the things that I did when I was working a full time job is I had you know I knew that I had a salary that I that I could use as backup. So my wife and I decided, you know, a year before um, I started Super Friendly, we decided that um, at some point we knew that we were going to start it and um, that we should try it out so that we knew what it, would, what it would look like. And so what I did for a whole year was I worked a full-time job at an agency and uh, came home and my wife and I ate dinner together and then I would work some more, you know, and I would work into the night and I would get a few hours of sleep. I'd wake up in the morning and go to work, you know, and I'd do that every day and I'd give up my nights and my weekends. And again, it, it was an investment. I didn't see my wife a lot. We didn't hang out a lot, but we both knew sort of what we, what that meant for what we, it was going to do for our future, you know? So, I, so in that year, I could take so many risks in freelancing because I had a full-time salary to back up on, you know, like fine. If a client said, no, we don't want to do this job because, you know, you price too high or we don't like your work or whatever it is. Well, that's great. That's fine. No problem. Like financially, I'm I'm secure because I have a full time job. So, um, you know, it was important to me to make sure it didn't affect my full time job because I didn't want it to do that. But um, but I I prototyped the whole thing. I prototyped like what should go in my contracts and what do clients object to and how much could I charge for this? Like what happens if I double my rates and um, you know, all sorts of stuff. I just tried it out because I had very little risk in that. You know, so I, I would say you know my advice is. Find situations where you have very little risk because when you have very little risk, you can take a ton of, of you can be really adventurous there, right? And if clients say no, well, no big deal because you have you know a savings account to back up you to back you up or a full time job or a side project or you know whatever it is. Take a take a second job if you want, you know, uh, like just to to ensure that a little bit um, and uh, an experiment to see what what's the thing that clients want from you. And how can you do that most effectively? And how can you make what you want to make from that? So I had a, you know, I had a, a really good experience sort of figuring that out. So when I worked, you know, when I opened Super Friendly, you know, day one of Super Friendly was technically like year one of Super Friendly, you know, because I already ha- had a whole year of experience doing it. Wow. In the Businessology show, you talk a lot about pricing. This is a this is a really big topic because yeah. designers. I always bring up designers because that's sort of what what I do. So, so a lot of designers have have trouble pricing things, and there we tend to be afraid of bumping the price up a little bit because we mm-hmm. think you know this isn't. It just feels weird. What's your what's your take on pricing? I mean, you you, you touch on it a lot on 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 uh, on the businessology show, but what's your take on on pricing and? What do you recommend for a, a designer to sort of do or maybe an exercise that uh, that we could practice to to figure that out for ourselves? Sure, yeah. Um, well, so that's going to be a big part of the book, you know, the, it, as, I, as I start writing it, is, is pricing because it is a big deal. Um, I think the first piece of advice about pricing is price the way you're comfortable with. If you price in a way that you're not comfortable with, it's going to come off that way and people are going to call you on it. Right. So like for me, I never really figured out hourly pricing. Like I just don't I don't really get how I could make good money doing that. Or at least good money compared to the way that I'm I'm pricing now. Um I'm a big proponent of value pricing because it works for me. So I wouldn't ever convince somebody who like has hourly pricing down to switch, right? Like just for the sake of like, oh, this is better. Because I don't think any way is better. I think whatever you're comfortable with, like it shows confidence in what you're doing. And I think that's important. Um so for the people that don't know what they're comfortable with, I I do recommend value pricing because I think it's um, it's more relatable. You know, for me it, it was more relatable, and a lot of people think of value pricing um, in a weird way, and I think I have some some unique thoughts about it. Um, I think a lot of people when they think about value pricing, they think about like, well, just multiply the amount of work, right? Like it's going to take me ten hours, and I charge a hundred bucks an hour, so my value price is going to be a thousand dollars, right? A thousand, a hundred times ten. 
Um, and that's not exactly value pricing. That's fixed pricing, and fixed pricing can be a form of value pricing, but it's not, they're not the same thing. So um, to me, value pricing is really about how valuable you are at the time. You know, and, and what I mean by that is um, I use a monthly cost to figure out my value because the reason is because I, um, I paid my bills every month, right? I don't pay hourly bills. Like I don't pay my phone bill per hour. I don't pay my gas bill per hour. I pay it per month. So for me, it, it simplifies the math. You know, I'm not, I'm not awesome at math. Um, so the simpler the math is, the, the better I'm able to do it. So I pay my bills every month. So if I can manage both income and, and outgoing cash per month, then it's just one point of focus for me. You know, I don't have to worry about what I'm making per hour and then what I'm spending per month. Like the two are dissonant. So, um, you know, my, I calculated my bills for the month and I, you know, I think it came out to like $6,700 a month is what I need, you know, is, is my cost. Um, and that's my mortgage and my gas and my electric and utilities and also shopping and groceries and what I want to put in savings and what my retirement fund, like my college plan for my kids, like all that stuff rolled in. It's like $6,700 a month. And so what I figured was, um, that's my value, right? If I need to make $6,700 a month, at least that's my cost. If I'm making less than that a month, then I am in debt, you know? So if a client came to me and said, we have a one month project and we're, we have a $5,000 budget, I can't really take that project because it means I'm in debt. Now, if they come to me and they say, we have $6,700, then yeah, I'll take that project because it covers my cost. If they say, I have $6,701, I'm profitable, right? As a business, I'm like, that's a profit. I've just made a profit. So, so I think for every person, value is different, right? They are valuable. They are a different amount of value than, than somebody else's. You are valuable than me. Like we're different in value because you might have a different cost to your life than, than I do to mine. Same thing with agencies. Like, you know, a lot of people think, well, if Pepsi came to me and, and asked me to do a logo, I would charge them a million dollars. Well, you don't really need a million dollars. So like it has nothing to do with what Pepsi can pay. It has all to do with how valuable you are. Right, so Pepsi may pay a, a giant agency a million dollars, but they might not feel good paying you a million dollars because they don't value you at the same way that they value a giant agency. So, so for me, like I like I try to describe value pricing in that way. Like, how valuable are you right now? So, you know, back to the the sixty seven hundred dollar amount. I figured if I could round it up to ten thousand dollars a month, you know, that's awesome. That would be great. You know, that's a great living for me. I live in a suburb of Philadelphia. I don't really need to make that much money. Um, that means that I could cover all my costs. I could put extra money in savings. I could, you know, I could invest some of it. I could do, you know, I, I have a nice margin on top of that. And, uh, and so that was what I, that's what I charge, you know, for one month of work, $10,000. You know, if, if it's two months of work, $20,000. If it's half a month of work, $5,000. And the math was easy for me to do. Um, and that was for me. So like, I'm not saying everyone should charge $10,000 a month because for them, you might not need that or you might need more. You know, so I think it's based on your value. Now, when I've got 30 clients that are knocking at my, on my door, I could raise my price because now I'm more valuable because my ability to walk away has increased. So now my value increases and I can charge more. If I have no clients and I only have, if I have one client that's saying, we have a month's worth of work and it's going to be $200. Well, if I don't have a choice, then that's really how valuable I am right there. Right. So like all the things that I try to focus on for my business is, um, how do I increase my value? And like, I can do that by attracting more work. That increases my value. I could um, make sure that the quality of my work is really good, you know, and that increases my value. I can make sure my ability to walk away at any time is, is, is really high. That increases my value. And then that, that changes my ability to, for what I need to charge, uh, charge clients or what I can charge clients. You know, I think, so that's kind of how I, I approach pricing. Um, I think the, the other big part of that that doesn't often get discussed is ethics, right? So like once you figure that out and you realize how valuable you are and what you can charge clients, that I don't think that means that you should be greedy about it. You know, I, I think that means, you know, there are times where you should leave money on the table, right? There are times where a client's going to say, we've got $60,000 and it's going to be more ethical for you to say, no problem, we'll do it for 40. Like, it's great. Well, you know, that $20,000 you guys should keep. Um, I think that's important, you know, to be ethical in business and to uh, to really like be responsible about what you're charging clients and that you're doing a good service for them. Um, but I think the combination of all that stuff is sort of how the way that I approach pricing. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's sure. amazing. Um, yeah. Dan, tell tell us about a challenge that you've faced in your business. Um, mm. You know, I like to bring up challenges to sort of, you know, we talk about the great side of things, but 
we don't hear we don't often hear sort of the uh, the, the the difficult parts of you know running a business <laughs> or, or or being a designer and whatnot. Um, what what kind of challenge have you faced, and how did it get resolved? Oh man, there's so many challenges. Um, some of them are not resolved. You know, to be to be quite honest, <laughs> um, I don't even know where to start on answering this question. Uh, time is always a challenge. You know, when you run your own business, like you don't, it doesn't turn off. You know, like you're responsible for your livelihood, and and you know, for me and for a lot of people, the livelihood of my family. And, you know, my wife's a stay-at-home mom. You know, I'm the sole income provider of our family. That's that's a lot of pressure. You know, so it's hard to turn it off sometimes. Um, you know, I certainly have nights where I go to bed thinking about projects, and times where I wake up thinking about projects, and um, that's not always healthy. You know, I, I believe in balance, and and that creates a lot of imbalance. You know, when you just spend all of your day thinking about work. Um, because it means that you know my kids aren't getting my attention, and my side projects aren't getting my attention, and my you know my music as a hobby isn't getting my attention, and like like all that stuff, you know. Um, so I, I think that's one challenge is being able to be strict about your time. Um, what I'm finding more and more, and I think having kids ha- like did this for me is the more strict I am about my time, the more efficient I am. So I'm actually am finding ways to be to work less and less and less, and it's actually making me more efficient. You know, so I really am trying to to hold that as a standard. I don't check my emails on weekend. I don't check my email on weekends. I tell all my clients that um, because it would drive me crazy. You know, I would be always thinking about work. So when I sign off on Friday night, I don't check it again until Monday morning. Um, uh, you know, and I think and I don't work more than like fifty hours a week. You know, at, at max, I think more than that is is as an imbalance. Um, and there are times, you know, there's certainly exceptions to that rule, but I try to make that the rule. There are times where you know, we're launching sites or we're, you know, putting in the extra mile for, for a deliverable or, or something like that. I think that's par for the course. But uh, as a general rule, I like to try and keep it to like a 40-hour work week if I can. Um, so time is definitely a challenge. Um, you know, I, I'm a designer. I, I never was like, I'm going to go to school to be a business owner. You know, I, like that doesn't, <laughs> that was just never a thing that I, you know, that I wanted to do. Um, finding time to design while being a business owner is really difficult. You know, I'm, I spend most of my time on the phone and on Skype and talking to people. And then it's like, you know, 6 p.m. And I'm like, cool, now I can comp some stuff, you know, and that and that really stinks. Um, I think that's I haven't really found a way to resolve that, you know, other than being even more strict and and saying like, all right, we're going to, you know, I'm going to just shut off to the rest of the world for a little while and let my email back up and, so that I can be in Photoshop or I can, you know, be coding something. I think that's that's been a challenge. Um you know the the independent world or running your own business is like a feast or famine thing too. You know that's incredibly challenging. Um, there are times where I have no projects. You know where I'm just like, okay, well, hope something comes in. You know, and I, I don't even follow my own advice about like being proactive about it. You know, <laughs> just like hope somebody emails me about a project, um, and I'm getting better about that. Um, but it's it's still challenging. Um, and then there are times where it's just like incredibly busy, you know, and we're rolling in cash, but we're also like spending all of our time doing stuff. So, um, that's been, that's been really challenging to, to get used to. And I don't, I couldn't even say that I'm, I'm fully used to that yet. You know, right now I don't have any projects that I'm working on. That's, that's true. There's like two really small ones that I'm working on right now. Um, and we're pitching on, I have a, a board next to me that has all the, uh, all of the new business stuff. And I think I don't know there's like 20 projects that we're that we're potentially pitching on, um, and you know some of them are small, some of them are huge, and and uh, you know that's a it's a really tough place to be to have that much work to do, you know, because new business is really hard, you know, writing proposals and sending emails and um, have, and being on the phone all the time, you know, doing that essentially as cost of business, you know, I'm not getting paid to do that, we're not getting paid until we until we start a project, so all of that stuff is is an investment in time. You know that's challenging too. So I go on and on about this stuff, but those are I think those are sort of the major ones that are on my mind. When you talked about uh, being more efficient with your time, <clears throat> do you find yourself producing a lot more? Uh, I find myself able to produce a lot more. I don't find myself producing a lot more, mostly because I try to safeguard my time. So if I worked, you know, an, an extra twenty hours, I could do that much more, right? So like the way I see it, um, I've learned to be really efficient. So what maybe a uh, an entry level designer could do in forty hours I could do in ten right so i could I could probably quadruple the output of another designer um, that doesn 't mean I do it just means I can work less right it, rather rather than trying to put out four times the amount of work in the same amount of time i 'd rather just do the same amount of work in a quarter of the time 
you know, so, so that's kind of what I mean about like trying to safeguard my time. If I know that I can be efficient, how do I use that to my advantage rather than just saying like, I'm going to generate and generate and generate stuff. Um, and then, you know, knowing that that's an addicting feeling for me. Dan, what, um, do you have any books you recommend for, for designers? Let's say, you know, let's keep it, let's keep it on, on, on business actually. Okay. A designer that's interested in getting into business or, or, or going off on their own. Oh boy. That's a good question. Um, I think the one that is always talked about, uh, I think Jason Blummer mentioned this, uh, you know, when, when you were on with him, um, uh, positioning for professionals. Um, that's a great book by Tim Williams. It's really just about like finding who you are and, and, and being intentional and strategic about the clients that you are trying to get and the, the type of work that you're trying to get. It's a great book. And Tim Williams is a, is a really, really smart dude. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really good one. Um, Let's see what else. Um, you know, I can only sort of think of things that I'm reading currently. Uh, there's a, there's a ton of books um, right now. Um, I, I'm a Christian. I I am reading a book called um, Business Principles for the Workplace. I'm sorry, Business by the Book: Biblical Principles for the Workplace. Um, that's something that's been giving me a lot of value to read. That um, just sort of like thinking about how I can be ethical and be good and moral in a business, you know, in a, in a business sense where a lot of people are sharks and like to take advantage of people. So um, it's really important to me to be ethical about it and, uh, and anything that I can sort of pick up to help me do that is, is really great. Um, I've come across some like, you know, e even if it's not books, it's cool to mention articles. Yeah, and absolutely, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I came across a couple of articles, like some, some on Medium, some elsewhere about like CEOs that, um, like lessons that CEOs learn about, you know, products and how to be a CEO and how to build culture and, and all that stuff. Um, I can't think of one in particular. Um, I can, you know, I, I might send you some links after the show cool. to, to yeah. put show notes or anything, but, um, that's been really valuable to me recently too. Awesome. What about software? Any, any particular piece of software that you would recommend, um, as uh, a designer? Oof. Um, I don't know, maybe the, the, I mean, as a designer, you know, Photoshop is, is my bread and butter. Like, I love Photoshop. I have it open every minute that I'm at my computer. Um, that's hard for me to get, get away from. But I also think, um, for me, I've been writing a lot more. I think writing is a really great skill that not a lot of designers take advantage of. Um, so a lot of my tools that I like best are ones that let me write. Um, I, I like notational velocity, and there's a fork of it called um, NV-Alt. And that's a, it's a, a note-taking app that's really fast. Um, and I really like the interface, and it syncs to my phone and everything. Um, NV Alt is a fork that lets me write Markdown, so I often write Markdown that just like keep my notes um, pretty streamlined. And uh, so I really like that. I've been writing in that forever. Um, editorially is another thing that I really like. Recently, um, I, it's hard to live without it now uh, because I just write up my thought. Whenever I'm having a design problem, I'll usually hop out of Photoshop and just write it out. Um, and you know, I'm working on a couple products right now and the way that I've been sorting through any issues is just writing stories. So I've been writing a lot of narratives about, um, I don't know, users or about situations or like fictional, um, situations, of, you know, that I'm trying to design some UI for or something like that. And that's been really, really good for me. So, um, I really recommend writing tools for, for any designer that, um, sort of needs a bump. Before we wrap it up today on this episode, uh, where can we find you? Uh, I live in Philly. Um, I'm generally around. What's your Philly. address? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, you can't like literally find, like, you're not going to see me on Google maps or anything like that. But, uh, um, you know, I, I tweet on, uh, at, at, at Daniel mall. Um, I have a website, danielmall.com. Um, people can email me. I'm Dan at danielmall.com. Uh, that's probably as found as I want to be. I'd, I'd say. Nice. I'll have links on pencil versus pixel.com forward slash, Dan Mall. So everything we talked about, uh, all of the links, uh, the book recommendations, and uh, his contact info, his address. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> it'll be found on pencilrispixel.com forward slash Dan Mall. Dan, thank you so much for being on the show today. I really appreciate your time, and you've given a lot of information that I hope many, many designers, especially those that are thinking about going freelance, will take advantage of. And um, you know, we we'll hope to connect with you again soon. And Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks.